Jerusalem last week and began looking at the verses that have to do with his cursing the fig tree, cleansing the temple, and then discovering that the fig tree was in fact cursed. It did wither and, and the significance of that. But I ask you to read Zechariah chapters 9 through 14 between last week and today because that's going to help us better appreciate the things that are about to be told us in the final chapters of Mark. <coughs> First, let's go to the Lord in prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Help us by your Holy Spirit better to understand it, that we may take it to heart and enjoy an increase in faith and love for one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, Zechariah 9 to 14. I won't embarrass you by having you raise your hand if you read it or not. But those of you who did, what were some things that you encountered in those chapters that were familiar to you? The cold. All right, right off the bat, you have in Zechariah 9. Let me turn to it myself. Zechariah 9, uh, what is that, 11? That has the nine. promise of the... Or 9-9, nine, nine. yeah, 9-9. Nine, nine. What else? Was the Lord pierced? Ah, the, he is pierced. That's right. That that's That's in there. Let's see. Uh, where, where do we get the 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 being pierced reference? Verse ten and beyond of twelve. In chapter twelve, right? What else? It says at the very very end, there shall uh, no longer be a traitor in the house of the Lord of the. Aha! <laughs> On that day. On that day. And. What does that uh, remind us of? Him, uh, clearing the temple. Yeah, clearing the temple of the money changers. Clearing the temple of the traitors. Some of you might have a different word there. Anybody have a different word than traitor in that last verse of Zechariah 14? Canaanite. 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 Now. Because that's literally the word in Hebrew. Canaan is the land of traitors. Oh. That's what, what uh, a Canaanite is, or Canaan is. Mm -hmm. Other things between 9 and 14. How about in, in chapter 11, the Lord said to me, uh, throw it to the potter, and he took the 30 pieces of silver and yeah. threw them into the house of the Lord. Yes. That's what Judas did. 30 pieces of silver comes from Zechariah. The, the betrayal of Christ with 30 pieces of silver is a fulfillment of of that verse, which is in the, this section of Zechariah. What else? Not just the 30 part, but what's the other part of that? We threw them into the house of the Lord. Okay, right. We had to, they, they throw them into the house of the Lord, right? The priest won't accept the blood money. But but what else is mentioned that's, that's connected with the betrayal of Jesus for 30 pieces of silver? What's bought with the 30 pieces of silver? The potter's field. Potter's field. Mm. Yeah. Any other bits that jog your memory? It talks about the wound on, the, on his back. Yeah. Um, we have a picture of the suffering described in, in these verses. Anything else? Mm 
How about, uh, don't we get the uh, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered in, in 13 verse 7. Jesus quotes that at Gethsemane. When he's praying and then, then when he sees the uh, Judas and the soldiers coming to arrest him, you know, he says that that, uh, that that as it says, he will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And that's fulfilled in the disciples abandoning him in that hour as he is goes to goes on to literally get struck. And he, so, so I, I guess at, at the very least we can say lots of things here that get fulfilled in Jesus' passion, in his week of, of suffering, and, and especially on uh, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. Fair enough? Moreover, think of this. The section begins with the prophecy of the king bringing salvation, coming on a colt, coming on the fold of a donkey. And it ends with, there shall be no traitors in the house of the Lord. Chapter 11 of Mark begins with Jesus coming in on a donkey, and the very next thing he does is chase out the traitors from the house of the Lord. The bookends of 9 to 14 in Zechariah are right at the beginning of Mark's account of Jesus' passion in Holy Week. What does that tell you, the hearer, steeped in the Old Testament? Go, no, go ahead. I was going to say that he's the one and it's about ready to begin or he's fulfilling all this. Yeah, and, and, and if, if we're given at the very outset the beginning and the end of this prophetic section of Zechariah, what now is the expectation at, after the event of Jesus cleansing the temple? Everything in the middle is about to happen. Everything in the middle is about to happen. It's happening. Yeah, because you ask, okay, we've got the first thing and the last thing, but what about all the stuff in the middle? Just wait. Here it comes. Do <laughs> you see that? And, and we, we've said it over and over and over again in this class that as we see individual verses of the Old Testament fulfilled, we ought not think that it's just that particular line that's getting plucked out and fulfilled, but rather the wider context is also being fulfilled. So when we see Jesus coming on a donkey, it's not enough to think, oh, that's specifically referred to in Zechariah 9 verse 9. But no, no, you go back to Zechariah 9 verse 9 and see how it's part of this bigger picture. And what is that bigger picture? Well, in Zechariah 9 to 14, what we have are two things happening to Israel. And what are those? Israel is at the heart of this chapter. God's people. They are going to be what first? Scattered. Scattered. Punished. But then in the end, they will be what? Restored. Restored. So they're going to be cast off by the nations. But in the end, they will be restored in such a way the nations come to them. And the nations are in big trouble if they don't worship their God. That's all there in Zechariah 9-14. to So that, uh, you've got that, that wonderful last promise. Uh, look, look at, at verse 20. This kind of ties in even with, with what we talked about today in church and, and the wedding feast in Cana and, and the significance of Jesus taking water from... Uh, water reserved for rites of purification and turning that into wine uh, to point to himself as the one who, who makes clean and, and in turn holy. Look at this, 20. 
And on that day there shall be, this is Zechariah 14, verse 20. On that day there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord. And the pots in the house of the Lord shall be as the bowls before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. And there shall no longer be a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. What, what, what's, what's the point? What's the, what's the great cause of rejoicing to hear that the bells of the horses will have inscribed on them, Holy to the Lord? Or that the pots used in the house will, will be as, as holy as the pots on the altar? What, 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 what's that getting at? What, what, what's, what, what does that have in its background? Kind of an all-encompassing uh, restoration. Yeah, an all-encompassing restoration, and and the, the this holy to the Lord business, and and the pots of the house being at uh, being as the bowls before the altar. What 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 distinction is is being abolished here? Everything is sanctified. Clean and, Everything is clean and unclean. Clean and, 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 and holy and not holy. Yeah. Everything now is, is holy. And, and I, I allude to this in, in the discussion this morning, the sermon this morning, that see the rites of purification were set up so that something that has become unclean Right? If, if you are unclean according to the laws of Leviticus, uh, it, it's not only not that you, you can't come into the temple or something like that, but it would be dangerous for you to do so. You see, unclean things are, are ineligible for holiness. So what must happen first? They must be made clean. And yet not all clean things are made holy. See, you, 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 you have in your house pots for cooking and stuff, okay? Those pots should be clean. They, you know, <laughs> un, non-kosher stuff shouldn't have touched them. They shouldn't have come in contact with, with, with something that's dead or, or blood or, or a Gentile or something like that. That They need to be clean. But those pots can't, simply because they're clean, now be used in the temple. That's another stage. That's another step. Only clean things are eligible to be holy, but not all clean things are holy. Okay? You, you follow me? You, you, you go unclean, can't be used in the house, certainly can't come, come into contact with, with, with God. Right? Clean, okay, can be used in the house, can come into regular contact with a the, with the, with the believer, with a member of, the, of Israel, but isn't apart from God designating it as such allowed to be in the temple. <coughs> but it's eligible to be if God so, so, so chooses. But those distinctions are now being abolished. There's going to be a day, Zechariah says, when that's abolished, when even the pots in the house are considered as holy as the bowls on the altar. When even the bells on the horses are considered holy to the Lord. See, that, that just wasn't a thing. That made no sense. Bob's ringtone is what? Is, that's, that's 80s. That sounds 80s to me. You know what? Okay. Uh, yeah, he's probably 80s. <laughs> okay. Um, but, 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 all this made possible by Jesus' atoning death and resurrection. See, he, He's the one to whom all those rites of purification pointed. All the sacrifices pointed. That, that whole system of clean versus unclean, of holy versus un, of not holy, uh, all, all that is pointing to the need for Christ and then what Christ actually comes to do so that now we're no longer under that system anymore, Christ Himself directly 
makes clean and holy. We've been seeing this throughout the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus isn't observing these distinctions when he interacts with lepers or with corpses. He touches them. That makes you unclean. Not Jesus. Instead, it's the other way around. Jesus makes what's unclean not only clean, but holy. So, he, he, he reverses the, the contamination. Right? I mean, he, he uncontaminates by his touch. Uh, your, your, your uncleanness doesn't make him unclean, but his cleanness transfers to you. And, and, and there's going to come a day when he transfers that to all of creation. We have this full restoration. And in that day, we'll know what's going to happen because what's going to happen, the traitors are going to be chased out of the house of the Lord. All, all a signal of... So, so when, when the disciples witness this, they, they, they know where that shows up in the Old Testament, the business of running out the, the traitors in the house of the Lord. It's in the same context as holiness being brought to all of creation. And so now this, is, this has got to be in the back of their mind. And you see how important it is to read the, to know your Old Testament. The, the, the New Testament, you, you could nearly go so far as to say, doesn't make sense without the Old. It's, certainly it makes fuller, better sense only if you've read the Old, only if you, you know the Old. Uh, so all the more reason to, to read the Old Testament and often. I mean, I, for those of you who did read 9 to 14... Uh, between now, between last week and today, w w did you come away saying, "Oh, I know exactly what that's talking about"? <laughs> a anybody dare to? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, of course. And yet, there, there were there were things that you said, "Oh, I, 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 I've heard that before. I've heard that before. Oh, yeah, yeah. Th this is th this is Judas and the twenty thirty pieces of silver. This is." Uh, uh, the, the sheep being scattered, the disciples leaving Jesus on uh, the night he was betrayed, and so forth. We, we've talked about this before, but do you think the writers of the Gospels are seeing this in hindsight versus them actually realizing it at the time? Because if people were realizing it at the time, you'd think the Pharisees and scribes would kind of say, "Yeah, well, does that harken back to Zechariah?" Right, right. Yeah, I, I think, and, and here's where, where Mark gives us this wonderful image that, that ran through the first half of his gospel, or at least, we're, we're in the last section. We're, we're, we're in the passion section of, of Mark's, Mark's gospel. And preparatory to that, we've had the, the image of the, 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 the healing of the blind man in two stages. Remember that? And, and, and that actually is, is the, the, the left bookend for the section right before this one. That section begins with the healing of a blind man in two stages and concludes with the healing of blind Bartimaeus in just one. And, and when Bartimaeus is healed, what does he do? He follows the Lord on the way. And, and so what, what, what's the significance of that? The disciples have, up until the point in which Jesus has healed the, the, that first blind man, they kind of get Jesus, but not really. It's going to take more work, more time, to get to clear vision. And after you've gone through all, you, you get three passion predictions in that section. You, you, you get Jesus saying that it's, it's uh, a matter of taking up your cross and following Him. That He's going to give His life as a ransom for many. And so forth. So that by the end, if not the disciples, we know the disciples still are confused in the story itself. But that's not the only one paying attention. Who else is getting this? You are. You the hearer of Mark's Gospel are getting it. So now you are in the position, as it were, of blind Bartimaeus, where you've been, through this exposition, been led to see Jesus more clearly, so that you're better prepared for what's about to happen in the Gospel. And, and did people at the time get this? I think some of them may very well have. 
We talked about this last week with the, the entry into Jerusalem. And for them to shout the words from Psalm 118 shows they get something more than the, the average person acquainted with, with Jesus' ministry. They get, they, they get it that He's come to fulfill these kinds of things from the Old Testament. But what they probably don't get so fully until he actually dies on the cross is, is what those Old Testament verses and promises and prophecies about the future restoration of Israel on the earth really meant, what they were really about. Did they really get that it wasn't a, a kingdom of this world kind of thing? Uh, how, how big of a factor did, um, did, did sin and forgiveness play in their minds? As, as they saw in Jesus the fulfillment of these things. And, and, and for us, at least, to realize, you know, the, the point of bringing up Zechariah 9-14 to and, it's, and the wider context that now Jesus is fulfilling is, remember, starting in the very beginning of the Gospel of Mark, and, and, and this is a story told by more than Mark. Uh, Matthew's doing it as well. And that is that in Jesus you have Israel reduced to one. Jesus is standing in for Israel. So Ze Zechariah 9 to 14, everything you read, you, you, you read in, 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 in the first hearing of it as applying to this group of people called Israel. And then you think, oh, wait a minute. Jesus at his baptism was declared to be God's son. Who's God's son? Israel's God's son. But now it's just this one who's God's son. Who's going to be God's son in a way that God's son failed the first time around. And so likewise here. He's Israel. Israel comes down to him. And now he, standing in the place of Israel, is going to do all the things that Zechariah 9-14 to talk about. He's going to be punished. He's going to be cast off by the nations. But then he's also going to be restored in such a way that the nations come to him. See that? Okay. So, so that, that's at the very outset of this section of Mark. Mark 11. We get the Zechariah 9 to 14 as bookends. The, the first half, <laughs> the, the, the beginning and the end of that section is, is the opening events of, of this section, and now the expectation is, as one of you said, that the middle stuff's going to start falling into place. Okay, um, let's, let's pick up again in verse 12 and, and get this, um, the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple and all that straight. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Uh, a, a few things that I don't think we called attention to last time. We, we said the business about how it, it's significant that Jesus does not say, May no one ever eat figs from you again, but that he says fruit. Fruit. And we've heard the word fruit used before to mean not literally uh, apples and peaches and figs, but the good works that, that, that follow from one, one who's been brought to faith in Christ, or uh, the, 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 the whole activity of, of, of one who, who believes God's word. Uh, you know, think of those parables back in, what is it, Mark 4, with the, the sower of the seed, but you also have the, uh, the mustard seed and, and, and the, this, this little seed, but, but it produces a, a, a tree, you know, so big. Um, in, in the sower of the seed, the, 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 the soil that bears much fruit, see, um, in, in, you, know, it, 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 you have four kinds of soil, and then and that, that fourth example, it bears much fruit. What, what, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, something like that? Uh, fruits used there. So, okay. Uh, also, that he sees it in the distance first. And from a distance, what does it look like? 
victory. A victory and leaf. And so you think from a distance, okay, this is promising. Uh, I'm hungry, I'm going to get something here. Okay, But then when he actually looks at it up close, no figs yet. And, and of course, shouldn't shouldn't be figs based on the, the season, right? Okay, because because this that isn't the point. That that isn't the point. Um, or, or 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 it's not. Mark isn't giving this. Jesus doesn't doesn't do this. You know, simply as a you know a kind of a casual incident. There, there's great significance into what's happening here, such that we could think of this as an enacted parable. There, there's almost a literary quality to this action. Okay? But hold that in, in the back of your mind. We've got the business of seeing it from a distance, it appearing to the, to, to the distant observer, uh, we, we, we've got fruit here. We, we've got something good going on. But in actuality, no. And then we get what? We get, we get the account of him coming into the temple. They came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought. And, oh, I, I, I meant to do this last week. I meant to do it this week. But got bogged down in that Zechariah reading. <laughs> Was that difficult? Uh, I, I know one of our, let, let's see, where's our index of uh, illustrations? There's the maps. Uh, what, what I want is a, the illustration of the temple. That, that's going to that's gonna be very helpful for us. Articles and charts list. Whew. This Bible almost has too much. There's just too many helps. I mean, you, 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 you're up to Roman numeral 110 CX before you get to Genesis 1. Think of that. Uh, does, does anyone happen to have the uh, page number in the study Bible of the uh, kind of the cross section of, of the temple? I get the maps index, but, but there's not a. Are they going to count it as a chart? Let's see. Do, do, do. I think it'd be an Exodus. Tabernacle. Let, 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 let's try. Uh, no, let, let's, let's do. Uh, let's do Temple. Temple would be better. Temple would be more in Solomon, wouldn't it? Yeah, but they're, they're going to rebuild it according to more or less the same floor plan. That, that, that's the important thing. But if, if only we had a, uh, a temple chart. We'll edit all this out for the YouTube posting. <laughs> wow, today's class was only 40 minutes. On the phone... Yeah, but that passing that around would it be COVID compliant? No. <laughs> oh, Herod's Temple. Let's try that. Seventeen ten. So turn to page. <laughs> this always reminds me. Peggy was there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it is. Here it is. This is great. Page seven, seventeen ten. When when I told the children in chapel, remember that Peggy? I said turn in your uh, <laughs> turn in your Bibles to page one thousand forty five. <laughs> The kindergartners. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we're not supposed to know to a hundred until the end of the school year. Uh, you know, you, you, you gotta you gotta challenge them. Let's see. Well, it, okay, it's 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 not going to. Uh, bring attention to this, but, but you at least get, you get the overhead. Those of you who have the Lutheran Study Bible, on page 710, you, you've got the, um, uh, the, the, the overhead cross-section of the different precincts of the temple area, and, and that will become important for us in just a second to understand what exactly is going on here. 
in the, the chasing out of people. Okay? So he entered the temple and he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned. And everywhere you see temple, I, I think our, our inclination is to think of, okay, they're inside the building. But, but the word for temple here is a broader word than that. It just means the whole temple area. Because there's a place where this is to be done, or, or there's a place where this is going on, and it's not literally inside. Um, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. So remember, we had, before this, the day before this, or let's say the evening that, uh, of the day he entered Jerusalem, what did he do? He kind of looked around, remember? And then he went to Bethany. It, it, it's like he's scouting things out. And so he already has an idea of what's going on in the temple precincts. It's like he's, he's filed this away, and I'm going to do about I'm going to do something about that next time I'm in town. Okay, and now he does. Okay, uh, let's point a few things out that maybe we don't always uh, it doesn't always register with us in the way we picture this scene. Imagine this scene. Who did he drive out? The money changers. The money changers. He didn't just drive out the changers. The merchants. Those who sold and those who bought. Both sides of the transaction are being chased out by Jesus. I think we forget that. That that the the the, the problem isn't ultimately that this is going on. Because if, if, if it were that, that they had set up their, their money-changing table, right? why would Jesus be equally upset with the people coming up to the table? But he is. Yeah, yeah, right. The, when you came to the temple, you were supposed to bring your gifts. Yes. Now, was this a matter of convenience that they... You, you, you didn't have to bring a gift. You could buy one when you got there. Yeah, okay. So we've got two things going on, two important transactions that need to take place. And this goes back to the whole getting there, the pilgrimage that led up to there. You've got all these out-of-towners. There for what reason? Passover. Passover. Celebrate Passover. Now, when you came to the temple... Going back to the days of Leviticus, right? You were to bring for your sacrifice an animal. What, what, depending on the sacrifice and your socioeconomic level, you know that would determine the animal you brought. But an animal that was what clean, clean and unblemished, yeah. perfect. Now, how, how likely are you to be able to bring an animal from, let's say, Libya? all the way to Jerusalem and it still be clean and unblemished when you come into the temple. Not very likely. So you didn't bring an animal. What did you do? You bought one when you got there. You see? So, so that's one of the transactions that's taking place is the buying of, of the animal for the sacrifice. Uh, but there's also a kind of temple tax you have to pay a temple tax to enter the temple. And that temple tax had to be paid in a, in, in, in a coin that only the temple authorities accepted. So, so that they, they, you know, and, and we have, we, we have from, from archaeology remnants, you know, examples of these, these coins. So you, you, don't, you don't have the coin, uh, you being a, a Cyrenian or an Arabian, but you buy one. 
you, you, you buy the accepted coin when, when you get there. So, so those are the kind of transactions that are going on in the, um, the, the money changing area. I guess it would be like currency exchange too, right? If there's different currencies maybe? Y yeah, but, but it's currency exchange primarily for the temple tax coin. Right. It's not just, you know, I'm in Jerusalem, and, and hey, would you exchange my lira for uh, denarii? Or, no, 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 no. They've got a Jewish coin that is set aside for the purpose of, of and, and it's, it's exceptionally pure. It, it's like, um, if not 100%, it's, it's between 80 and 100% pure silver, something like that. And, 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 and the coins of the realm weren't, right? Um, this was a practice. Fortunately, it's not of present-day rulers, but they would um, they, they would adulterate the the, the money supply uh, by by you know you're you're, you're supposed to be using a, a hundred percent gold coin uh, and, and it's only fifty percent pure. But but we, we don't do stuff like that anymore. <laughs> right? just and, and I don't see how printing, printing more money is, is at all uh, analogous to that. No, no, no. It's a perfectly acceptable practice. Uh, but but it's, it's getting, it, it's turning in your bad money for the good temple tax coin to, to be able to go into the temple. Uh, the problem, though, Here's, here's what Jesus' words tell us is the problem and what has made us, made him so upset. Is that this activity is going on, if you look at the illustration of the, um, the, the, the top view picture on that page 1710, this is going on in what was, what would have been, uh, the Gentile court area. Okay, so obviously a Gentile wasn't allowed into the temple. Uh, but but what did go on in what was known as the Gentiles court? By, I mean, by the way, you know the, the Gentile court that this kind of courtyard, right? We we we, we have this to this day. You 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 we have the inscription uh, on uh, on the wall that says. You know, something along the lines of, um, may, may you and your family be accursed if you, a Gentile, step past this point. You see? Okay. But, though, though there was that warning about proceeding any farther, you know, any closer to, you know, the ultimate place in the temple, the Holy of Holies, nevertheless, there was what? There was a, a, a wall that I think came up, maybe, maybe to... Maybe um, between the knee and the waist. It, was, it wasn't a, a, a tall, a very high wall, but, but it was a wall that, that you faced to do what? Pray. 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 And, and as far as I know, I think that wall is still, there's still a wall that serves that purpose. And anybody been to, to Jerusalem? Been, been to the temple area? Okay, well, anyway, th th that, that's, that's what that courtyard is set up for. Prayer. And what is instead go, what, what is instead going on? Merchandising. Yeah, the authorities have decided here's where we're going to set up the money changing and the buying and selling of animals for the sacrifice. And, and Jesus is saying, no, no, no. The, the, the purpose of this place is to pray. It is to welcome even the outsider so that he might have access to the God of Israel. And what are you doing? You're saying, oh, you know, fooling on them. That this is where we're going to sell the... It didn't have to be there. They could have set up their tables and their animal business outside of that area. But no, no, no. We're going to take over over temple area for this. Temple area that God said was a place for prayer and they've turned into trading. Merchandising. That's the... And... and, and uh, Woe not just to the ones making the exchange, you know, to, to the ones selling the animals, but also to the ones who have made the pilgrimage and are buying them there. That you too have missed the point. Now, who set this up? 
Who authorized the money changers to do this in this particular place? So I mean the Pharisees or, or the, the... Well, the temple authorities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the, the religious leaders who ran the temple. So what do you think their reaction to Jesus doing this is? Not good for business. Mm-hmm. Not good for business? Yeah. <laughs> Who does this guy think he is? I mean, it's our temple. It's got to be their attitude. And how dare he come and and and, and say our rules are, aren't to be followed. Remember what we said last week? How so much of, of what leads to Good Friday, what leads to his crucifixion, has to do with just the things that happen Sunday through Thursday. This really ticks them off. Heard someone say, tell the story of actually going going to Jerusalem, uh, Holy Land trip, and he and the tour he was with. They were going down a just a you know a street of of of, uh, of, of a Jewish uh, town. I don't. It wasn't necessarily Jerusalem, and all of a sudden. In uh, you know, out of nowhere, old man, old Jewish man, with a shofar, you know the the, the horn, right? And and he's blowing it, and he's he's animated and shouting all kinds of stuff, okay? And and you know the the, the, the pastor and his family, they, they don't know what he's what he's saying, but the tour guide does. And they're walking down the street, kind of like, um, oh, uh, a, a downtown street of shops. But the shops, I don't think it was as bad as this. You know, it wasn't a Victoria's Secret, okay? <laughs> but you, you had in the windows scantily clad mannequins and things like that. And, and, and you know, they're selling clothes that pious about Jewish boys and girls should not be wearing. And, and, and that's what the guy in the shofar is doing, shouting about, saying, you know, how, how you know, uh, uh, pox on your houses and, and uh, uh, you, you're, you're all going to come under judgment uh, for your immorality and so forth, okay? Now, now how, how do you think everybody in that street felt about that guy? <laughs> He's screwed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, and you got to think that's got to be the reaction to, to the folks, to Jesus, when he did this in the temple. You know, nut job. <laughs> right? And, and who does he think he is? And, and not only that, I mean, the, the, I think Mark's the only one that gives us this. See, it's not just the scene of, of making the whip and, 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 and uh, chasing them out and so forth. But look at this. It's like after he's done that, Verse 16, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything in the temple. It's like he's now patrolling the area, you know? And, and, and you know, someone, someone come, you know, he's got, a, got his money bag, you know, his family. You know, they've just arrived in Jerusalem. First thing we're going to do, we're going to buy our donkey, and here's Jesus. <laughs> okay, I'll try it tomorrow. <laughs> right? That, that's what he's doing. And he's keeping people out. At least the people that that come for that purpose, who come to buy and sell. Uh, And all because what? It's his house. And it's to be a house of prayer, not a den of thieves. And this is precisely what Zechariah promised would happen. That there would not be a traitor in the house of the Lord. And and now, here's the reaction. We're told the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him for they feared him because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. So we do find that many are hearing this and thinking, whoa, he's telling us the kind of thing we heard in Zechariah. That, wait a minute, what what are we doing buying and selling in a place that God set up to be a place for prayer and a place to welcome those for whom God invites? Um... And when evening came, they, came, they went out of the city. So, so there is that. And now we come back. Remember the sandwich, the intercalation? 
As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. So we've got ABA. We've got the, the fig tree story in closing the account of Jesus cleansing the temple. That should be a signal to us that the two are connected. Oh, yes, Dennis. Could it be that the whole cleansing in the temple thing is yet even another level of, I'm here now, there's nothing you can do to have God come to you in terms of a sacrifice. It's all about faith in me. And, and he, oh, a, a, absolutely. Yeah, he's come to replace the temple. Right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think that's going to come out in what he says about the fig tree. But, but that's right. That, um, uh, and it's, it's interesting in that it, the, the, the two things go together. That is that the plan all along was for Christ to be the, the sacrifice to which all the sacrifices established by the Old Testament pointed. And yet at the same time, the, the chief priests and the scribes, with their sinful attitude toward the temple and their abuse of it, create the need for Jesus to replace the Old Testament sacrifice. You, you, you see, I mean, the, the, the two kind of go to... It's, it's going to happen. I mean, Jesus, in the fullness of time, is going to come and replace the temple. And at the same time, he comes precisely because you guys abused the temple. <laughs> you, you didn't treat it the way you should have. You, you, you could have treated it faithfully. You could have treated it always as the, the pointer to me. And then I would have come, you know, whenever. But, but in, in a sense, you know, everything's coming to a head. They're, 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 they're making it more, all the more urgent for Jesus to fulfill that promise of being the temple in himself. Yeah. Um, so, 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots, and Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi! And that's also a, 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 a tell that, okay, he doesn't get it. Throughout, throughout Mark, and, and, and some of the other Gospels, see, calling Jesus Rabbi, is short of believing in him as Savior, as Lord. The, the ten lepers call him rabbi. Um, that means they, they, they get it, but they don't. They, they get that, that he's a source of healing. He has power. But they, they don't fully understand what he's come to do. And so likewise, for Peter to address him as rabbi... There, there, there's still a lack here, a lack of understanding. Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. <laughs> I mean, this has got to be the strangest thing at the time. To What on earth does faith in God have to do with cursing a fig tree? Right? Because it, it's not ultimately about the fig tree. Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Now we hear that as, whoa, prayer has the power even to curse fig trees and throw mountains into the sea. That is not the point. It's a parable. You know, it's, a, it's an enacted parable. The fig tree stands for something. This mountain stands for something. And think about that. He doesn't say, you can say to a mountain, but you can say to this mountain. What's this mountain? What would this mountain be? Where are they? Which is on? Mount Zion. Mount Zion, the Temple Mount. So, this mountain points to the temple that he just cleansed. 
what's the faith here about? What is it going to be very difficult for a Jew to accept that, that Jesus, we know, has come to do? And we've been talking about it for the last ten minutes or so. He's going to replace everything that they've been doing. Yes! I mean, the whole... Right! Their whole being, really. Yeah! I mean, I mean, the, the source of their identity, their security is all wrapped up in this house of the Lord called the temple. And sacrifice. And yeah, the sacrifice, right. And he's doing away with all that. And so what does he say? Have faith in God. You can say to this temple, go to hell. Because from now on, my identity, my security is in Jesus, who is the temple forever. Do you see? That's what he's giving them confidence to be able to do and to preach and to believe. That the temple is no, no longer where it's at. And he's just done something just as shocking, more shocking than curse a fig tree. He's chased people out of the temple over against the People running the temple and their rules. And he's reclaiming the temple, but he's reclaiming it by abolishing it. And now let's go back to the fig tree business. What about seeing it from the distance and, and thinking what? It's yeah, there, there, there's, there's likely fruit on this, this green tree, but there ain't. He goes to the temple. What do we have at the temple? A lot of activity. But it is an activity pleasing to God. It isn't fruit. It's all leaf and no fig. All leaf and no fig. <laughs> and that's, I think, a big takeaway for us as in our Christian life. I mean, it's, it's, it's a big lesson for us pastors that, that we can very much look at our busyness and, and, and hold it out Trust in it as, as proof that I'm doing the Lord's work. Look how busy I am. Right? Look how many visits I made. or uh, you know, Look how many meetings I attended. Or, or, or a church. Right? I, you know, I've, I've been in meetings where, where, where people say, you know, we, we, we had years and years ago uh, you know, a, a Jewish activity center that wanted to rent out the, the rooms in our basement and, and set up Monday through Friday. Right? They said, gosh, you know, it's, 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 it's explicitly not Christian, right? And, and then if we want those rooms, right? You know, we, we won't have them, you know, that kind of thing. And, and one of the, the points made in the argument was, ah, but think of all the cars that will be in our parking lot, right? And, and just the appearance of being busy is going to bring people to church on Sunday, right? Or, or to our school or something, right? You see, the argument was... Activity for activity's sake will, 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 will serve the, the larger goal. And, and, and so, so the temple, the temple's busy. But is it activity consistent with what God has, has willed? And, and, and sometimes it's, it's inactivity. It's or what, what looks like inactivity. Hearing the word. Meditating on the word. Praying. That's the fruit God wants. And it's, it's, uh, it's not a matter of, of busyness. Um, and, and so that, that, can, that applies to us as individual Christians. It applies to the, to the church. And, and the way we think about you know, carrying out what God wants us to do. Um, and I mean, and, and, and that's it. What, what, what does God want most of all for, for each of us? It, it, our whole Christian... Identity is grounded in the fact that, that what? what? What what about us is different? We're clean and we're baptized. baptized. Yeah, we're baptized. We're, we're baptized believers. Right? And then from that, what does God want us to do? He wants us to hear His Word, to be in His Word all the time, to be reading the Old Testament <laughs> over and over and over again so that when we read the New Testament, we, we get it better, right? But to be in prayer... Right? And then and then and beyond that, what, what does God want us? Forgive others. Yeah, forgive others, love our neighbor as ourselves. And what what does that look like? Well it depends on 
who you are, what station you're in, what, what calling you have in life, and the people God's actually placed into your life. You know, so that, that's going to look different for, for each of us, and yet it's the same in this way. It's a matter of loving the, the neighbor God's given you. Um, that's the fruit. That, that's the fruit God's looking for. It's not just any, in, any, any old busyness or act of life. It, it's a life active in those things. Uh, and, and, and God makes that clear in His Word to us. So, okay, th- th- that's actually a, a decent place to stop because we've um, c- kind of handled that unit, fig tree, cleansing temple, fig tree, uh, and, and maybe we'll, we'll start uh, next week with, with 25. And um, maybe homework assignment for you all is to uh, read, read verse 26. If you all would just read verse 26. That's a lot. That's not nice. <laughs> it, it's not there. <laughs> you, 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 your Bible should go from 25 to 27. <laughs> No, I'm not kidding. Uh, yeah, it, it's it, we'll, we'll talk about why 26. And it, you know, the guy that numbers these verses, you know, he forgets, you know. <laughs> you know, we all have these little uh, hiccups in our brain. And do, uh, so Sue's got 26. Do the rest of you have a verse 26? Oh, we got to go. Sue has the... Uh, she she she's got, she had the the green glasses. Is that what he what uh, Joseph Smith was given? Yeah, Sue put on her green glasses and she sees verse twenty six. And <laughs> well, we'll have you read to us verse twenty six. I mean, there, there is a verse that that the, the, the later the most manuscripts don't have, and we'll we'll, we'll talk about uh, why it's probably not in the original mark next week. But okay, uh, how about uh, we we close with the the benediction. Uh, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.